Hi, this is Ben Golub, CEO of Storage. Welcome to the Q3 Storage Town Hall. I'm joined by John Gleason, who is our Chief Operating Officer. And believe it or not, this is the 21st consecutive Storage Town Hall. Five years ago, we embarked on a journey to do something that had never been done before, to build an enterprise-grade, globally distributed, decentralized cloud storage. A lot of people have had that same idea over the years. A lot of other people have looked at the number of drives in the world that are already spun, powered, and cooled, and yet on average, drives in the world are less than 30% full and wondered, what could we do that would be useful with those hundreds of exabytes of unused capacity? But until storage came around, there was no solution that was enterprise grade in terms of performance, stability, durability, availability. And we have done so in a way that not only delivers on those important enterprise grade aspects, but also delivers compelling economics for both customers and suppliers. Through the efforts of a large and dedicated community and team, we're really starting to see that journey take off. And hopefully you'll have evidence of that through this town hall. The storage town hall itself is a part of our ongoing commitment to transparency. Uh, we're a company, a community, and a globally distributed network, and we believe that transparency is key to really everything we do. So we maintain open code, open development, open data, and hopefully an open dialogue. While most of the information in the quarterly town halls can be gleaned from other sources, some of which are listed below, we always enjoy this opportunity to connect with our customers, our partners, our node operators, our open source contributors, and more. Before we, we begin, as always, uh, a forward-looking statement. Uh, this document contains forward-looking statements about our product, network, and business, the development, release, and timing of any features or functionality described for our products remains at the sole discretion of Storage Labs. The information herein is not a commitment to deliver any material, code, or functionality, or make promises about anything related to our business, and should not be relied upon in making purchase or other decisions. And with that exciting uh, preamble out of the way, i give you a quick overview of our agenda for today. We're going to start with an executive summary, talk a bit about growth and customer momentum. Uh, I'll give a quick update on where our product and roadmap are going. And finally, John Gleason will talk about things of importance to our node and community members. But before we talk about how we're doing and what we're doing, it's worth talking a bit about why we're doing this. The world continues to make more and more data. Over 140 zettabytes of data were estimated to have been created in this past year. And to put that into perspective, I'm sure you all remember what CD-ROMs are. 1.3 millimeters thick and one CD-ROM could store most of the text content of the Library of Congress. If you were to take all of the data that the world created this year and store it on CD-ROMs, you'd need a stack of CD-ROMs that would stretch to the orbit of Mars and back. And by the way, the amount of data created is expected to grow 23% year on year over the next several years. In this era of concern about climate change, it's also worth noting that data is expected to account for about 14% of carbon output in the near future, more of a contributor than agriculture and about twice the contribution contribution from uh, all heating and cooling all residences. So data itself is not a minor contributor to global warming, but a large contributor today and potentially uh, one of the major contributors in the, in the near future. We need to do a better job. And fortunately, everything that storage has managed to do in terms of being uh, more energy efficient uh, and more cost efficient also makes us greener as well. So we know that the world's creating more data. We also know that there's lots of underutilized capacity. And because of the way that we do things, because of our ability to leverage all of this underutilized capacity that is globally distributed at the edge, we're able to be uh, radically faster, radically less expensive, uh, radically greener, uh, radically more durable, radically more secure, um, and do so in a way that is better suited for where the world is seeing the most growth in data, which is edge applications such as video and even AI and ML. So if that's the why, uh, let's talk about what exactly has been happening. And as a, as a summary, uh, Q3 was another breakthrough quarter for storage. Uh, to put things in perspective, a year ago, storage was a good drop in replacement for services uh, like Wasabi or Backblaze, and we were onboarding customers with tens of terabyte, terabytes. By six months ago, we were able to show that we were globally faster and globally more consistent than large hyperscalers such as AWS and Azure, and we started attracting customers with hundreds of terabytes. Now we are seeing that we are fast enough that we are beating CDNs in head-to-head -head comparison. We have several customers live with petabytes of storage and petabytes of egress, and we're now listing healthcare companies, financial services companies, and major studios among our customers and prospects. 
We're seeing mm. partnerships and customers pick up steam in key use cases such as video distribution, video production, the management of scientific data, log data, and more. And in newer markets, we're seeing traction, including serving uh, as the underlying storage layer for a vast number of AI and ML related use cases. Fundamentally, storage is great at getting large files securely and quickly to people around the world, and that is driving our growth. If you're producing a video that needs to be edited by teams from Burbank, uh, Bollywood, and Berlin, we're a great use case. You store one copy with us, and it's able to get quickly to those teams around the world. If you're generating large data sets that need to be analyzed in San Francisco or Sao Paulo or Singapore, we're a great solution. And if you want people to analyze, develop, and train on AI learning sets, uh, in places as far flung as Durban, Denver, and Dortmund, we're a great solution as well. In Q2, uh, we signed two of the biggest customers in company history, and we were proud to talk about that in the last town hall. Well, in Q3, we signed a customer that was even larger than them. And even more gratifying, this customer was in the healthcare space, and we won this customer in a competitive situation against both a major hyperscaler uh, and one of the biggest uh, on-premises names in the business. Beyond these large wins, we saw continued growth among all of our customers. And you'll see in a moment that the past 12 months have seen consistent month on month growth in paid data and revenue. We continue to see world class net retention numbers. Uh, we're seeing the benefits of having great go to market partners. And so our focus in this final quarter of 2023 is really more of the same better product, better performance, uh, and addressing the security needs uh, of our most demanding customers. Uh, and while we're doing this, we want to continue to tell the world our story. We just came back from a great NAB show in New York where we showcased our video solutions and we're part of the launch of the Digital Sustainability Alliance. And now a little bit about number about revenue and the numbers behind that. So here are some of the numbers that we track as a company. As you know, we generate revenue for ourselves and our community based on the amount of data that's stored per month and the amount of data that's egress per month. As we've added more data, we've also been gradually reducing the, data, uh, the test data that was created when we initially created our network. And as you can see, we've continued month on month growth in paid data up 33% quarter on quarter and 242% year on year. Behind these numbers is a pattern of growth in both new customers and continued expansion from existing customers. As I mentioned, one of the most important numbers that we track as a business is net expansion, which measures on average how customers grow and shrink. And what we're seeing is that customers who store data with us tend to store more data every month. Uh, and as a result, of course, that means that customers who are with us uh, in prior months are generating more and more re uh, revenue for us on average every month as well. Uh, our uh, net expansion number in September reached an all time high of 1.28. Uh, and that is beyond world class. Uh, it basically means that customers who are with us a month ago in August are on average spending 28% more with us uh, in September. And that kind of growth is continuing every month. And uh, just to be clear, that takes into account customers who expand uses, usage, uh, the customers who decrease usage, and an almost non-existent set of customers who are uh, who live in the network. So fundamentally, uh, this is one of the most important metrics for the health of our business. Uh, of course, we also track the quality of our service. Uh, we look at all of the abilities, the, uh, the ability, uh, availability, uh, durability, um, stability, and as you can see, our network is healthy on all of those dimensions. And of course, any information about the state of our network and the health of our network is available through our public, da uh, public data API as well as third party sources. Of course, I like the numbers, but I also like to talk about the uh, names that are behind the numbers. Uh, talked about customers in our last uh, all hands, uh, our last town hall. So now I'd like to mention a little bit about some of our world class partners. Um, most of our customers don't buy cut storage for the sake of storage. Instead, they're buying storage in the context of an overall solution. So we're excited to be working with world class video partners like a Tempo and Adobe uh, and GB Labs, world class backup partners like Acronis, uh, world class infrastructure providers like uh, iX Systems, uh, Equinix and Hammerspace. And in newer markets, you'll see us working with world class providers like LivePeer, which is uh, next generation transcoding, Akash, uh, Hugging Face, Replit and more. Now, like all people, we're, uh, of course, uh, excited by the extraordinary activity that's being seen in the generative AI space. And interestingly, it turns out that our globally distributed approach to storage is an ideal solution for generative AI as well. A fundamental problem in generative AI is building, training, and refining uh, uh, AI models by getting huge data sets, huge large language models to distributed GPU compute around the world. And storage turns out to be 
uh, really built perfectly for globally distributed, unpredictable GPU access patterns. As much of the momentum in AI is now shifting towards open source and open access, we're ideally situated here as well. So unsurprisingly, you'll see evidence of storage working with some of the leading names in generative AI, such as Hugging Face and Replit. And we've also helped step up to uh, help the community uh, through activities such as hoping, hosting the Llama data set from Meta. And uh, while you know, most of our focus tends to be on our customers and our partners, we certainly uh, are gratified to see that the news about storage is getting out as well. You can see a sample of the stories that were told about storage in the past quarter. And as you can see, uh, that coverage is in more mainstream uh, media outlets, things like uh, Forrester as one of the leading analysts, TechCrunch, PC World, CNBC. Uh, this is ex extremely uh, gratifying to us because ultimately we wanted to build a mainstream solution, not a new solution. And for the world to know what we're doing uh, and understand what we're doing and embrace what we're doing, it's important that we are doing an effective job, not only delivering on our story, but telling that story as well. Shifting now to products, uh, this has been another great quarter uh, for us in terms of product development. Our roadmap, issues list, tests, et cetera, are all open. And so if you really want to stay on, what's stay on top of what's happening with our product, uh, you can do so uh, in the open uh, in our GitHub repository. Uh, nonetheless, here's a summary. Uh, perhaps the uh, uh, biggest news, as always, is that we are working on performance and seeing continued uh, improvement in terms of performance. But we've also made major strides in terms of two new security uh, centric offerings, which we'll be talking about in the coming months, uh, laying the foundations for object versioning, uh, enhancing our UI, uh, enhancing uh, tools for those who are admins, uh, and ultimately delivering on a large set of large and small uh, uh, changes and improvements that have been suggested to us through the public API and public issues list. The biggest story, as always, though, is uh, the progress that we've been making in performance. This chat, this graph compares the time to download a one gigabit file from storage uh, in locations around the world versus AWS. Uh, again, we stored a one gigabyte file in storage and the same file in AWS West and then downloaded it to locations around the world. And the lower dot is on this graph, the better from a performance per perspective. And as you can see, storage's download performance is comparable to AWS on the West Coast of the US. But as you move forward farther afield, you notice two interesting things. The first is that storage stays globally consistent, even as we are downloaded in locations like Singapore or Bangalore or Sydney, uh, the speed is still fantastic. And second of all, you'll notice, of course, that we get dramatically faster than AWS, uh, the farther away that you move from uh, the nominal location of the data, even though we don't store additional copies around the world. And uh, as you know, we've been at this for less than five years. Uh, most of the hyperscalers spend 15 years or more building their infrastructure for other businesses, such as retail or search before they moved into uh, offering cloud services, and they've been at cloud services for about 15 years. So with really less than five years of running a service, the fact that we're able to be uh, this fast and uh, being not only competitive with, but in many cases faster than uh, the established competitors is a real testament, not just to the folks at storage into our community, but to the underlying model. And of course, uh, it's exciting to see that this same uh, pattern is holding true in the case of large language models as well. This is that same sort of uh, analysis except done in conjunction with the Lion uh, data set. You can see in terms of the map where uh, the various locations are where the pieces of that file are stored. And then you can see the time it takes to download that file from various locations using us uh, versus uh, using AWS or Azure. And again, we're globally consistent and uh, fast really around the world. Those past several slides we're talking about throughput, it's also important to talk about uh, latency as well. And latency is how long it takes for our data to begin flowing. Low latency is critical for several use cases, such as editing video, uh, fast forwarding in video, um, uh, doing responsive uh, workloads. And with some great work by our team, we've made huge strides in reducing latency as well. This chart uh, shows the responsiveness of our system as measured by locations around the world. And if you spend any time looking at this chart, you'll see that we can get sub 10 millisecond uh, responsiveness in much of North America and Europe and further afield, we're generally under 100 milliseconds. And uh, as we grow the number of nodes that we have globally and uh, our edge locations globally, uh, even farther afield, uh, we'll be able to do a great, uh, an even better job as well. Slide 16 shows time to first byte. 
uh, the col various colored lines show average and median times the first byte, as well as the 95th and 99th percentile. So we, uh, while we're excited by having fast uh, average times, we also want to make sure that even those customers who are uh, the slowest are still getting a great experience. And as you can see, over time, um, we've not only seen overall improvement, but we've really tightened the, the distribution of time so that whether you're uh, uh, on the, you know, you're the 1% slowest uh, or you're the average, you're getting a great responsiveness from, from storage, a uh, great time to first byte. Uh, and in most cases, that's under 500 milliseconds. And finally, I'll end with our environmental story. As I mentioned, this is a huge part of our mission as a company. Everything we do to make ourselves low cost and high performance also makes us green. By leveraging underutilized capacity, we're able to avoid the enormous cost of manufacturing drives, building new data centers, and spinning and cooling new disks. Uh, we can knock a zero off of both cloud bills and carbon footprints. And this is not just a feel good item. As I mentioned, if the world doesn't change the way that it's storing data, the way it's serving data, as data grows 23% a year, the carbon impact will grow by 23% a year. And if nothing changes, uh, we're on a path for data itself to account for something like 14% of global carbon. Um, many of us would struggle to uh, make changes in our daily lives that would have a meaningful impact on reducing global carbon. But those of us who are technologists, those of us who make technology decisions around uh, AI, around video, can have a meaningful impact on uh, on carbon by making intelligent technology choices. Uh, we're very excited uh, that storage is one of those solutions that can not only make a meaningful uh, difference in terms of global carbon, but do so while continuing to provide users an even better experience in terms of cost and performance, uh, security, et cetera. We can do well uh, by doing good and do good by doing well. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the ways that we can make green technologies uh, especially powerful. So again, thank you for all of your support in building a great uh, and a great delivering a great Q3 and in delivering um, delivering storage. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to John Gleason to talk to our community. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. It really is exciting to see all of the customer attraction we're getting, the usage of the services, the press coverage, the recognition in the market that we've built something really incredible here. And we can't thank our Snow community enough for being part of this experiment that has now turned into a highly competitive and disruptive cloud storage service. A few of the major initiatives that we had going on this quarter. Um, first, we completed the process to sunset some of our extraneous satellites. We had some satellites that were used for um, test services and for uh, technical previews of new capabilities. Um, and so we took those offline and we paid out any uh, remaining held amount that was associated with those services. We also made some changes to graceful exit to reduce that complexity and make it a lot easier for storage nodes to have a successful graceful exit if they wanted to take their nodes offline uh, and reclaim that, that uh, infrastructure for other use cases. We've also taken the, uh, the step to complete our cost alignment process. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but uh, really the goal of that process is to ensure positive unit economics for both storage and node operators. Um, and it's been a process that we've been uh, doing throughout the year and we've brought the, the final step through this quarter. Um, and uh, last but not least, we'll talk about the launch of the Commercial Storage Node Operator Program. Um, this is really an exciting uh, uh, new program that we've got, and it's brought some pretty exciting capabilities to the platform as well. First, just talking about the, uh, the Sunset satellites. Um, those were Europe North 1 and US 2, and so those satellites are offline permanently. All amounts are all paid out, and uh, we won't see those on the trusted list in the future. Um, with Graceful Exit, again, this is something where we've uh, gotten a lot of feedback um, over the last year, especially in terms of the complexity and uh, um, the, the challenges that some storage and operators with a lot of data had uh, completing Graceful Exit um, in either a reasonable time or sometimes at all with some of the, uh, the bugs that we found. And so we took a number of passes at uh, making graceful exit uh, function better as is. But ultimately, what we determined was that we could use our repair service um, and the audit uh, service to create a pull-based uh, model instead of having the storage node operators push their data out to the network. The repair checker would pull it and, and move uh, data that needed to be repaired uh, to different nodes in healthier places. And so what we found was this is a much less complex process. It takes a lot less time and it completes uh, successfully um, the overall majority of the time. 
and the feedback we've gotten from the storage node operator community on this has been very positive. Um, one of the other major initiatives uh, that we just announced the last step um, in the process is an update to our storage unit economic incentives. And so the idea here was to refine, refine this economic model um, to reflect the current future network uh, needs and trajectory. And so the goal again is to ensure this long-term sustainability so that both storage of operators and operators of satellites, including storage, can have sustainable unit economics that scale um, to allow offering a service that is excellent for our customers, excellent for storage and operators, and also allows storage uh, to have uh, a path to sustain that development and to pay for things like the servers and the people that build and uh, bring to market our excellent cloud object storage service. And so building towards that long-term growth of the network, um, we've reduced a lot of our historical payout rates. And again, we started with those higher payout rates uh, particularly on egress, to incentivize a network when we needed to have capacity in advance of customer paid demand. And so for all of the storage node operators who made the network possible and who helped give those initial customers that great experience that has allowed us to bring on some of the new uh, and exciting customers that Ben mentioned and to achieve that growth. Um, but part of that growth does, uh, does have to uh, lead into a sustainable business model for storage as well. And so over time, uh, we've drawn down uh, those higher incentive rates to bring the, the payout in closer alignment uh, with um, the fees that we're able to charge customers on the network. And so as of November 1st, we're making the final step to, to align all of the payouts to be identical on all of the satellites that are operated by storage. Uh, and those rates allow us to, to start to get to unit economics that makes sense for the network. Now. Uh, all payout rates are the same going forward, and we've gotten a lot of good feedback and had a lot of healthy dialogue along the way with our storage node operator community. And nobody likes to see the prices come down, um, but uh, what this does let us do is, is build a business for the future and to continue to feed and sustain that growth of the network. And so we've seen um, Wasabi and we've seen Backblaze and other competitors raising prices. And as we continue to uh, take market share and increase revenue, we'll have the opportunity to revisit pricing in the future and revisit the node payout structure as well. Uh, but for now, we have no further plans to make any further changes, and we are looking forward to additional service offerings uh, in Q4 and next year um, that can help us further build uh, a more sustainable network for the future. A big part of um, that opportunity for the future comes in the form of the commercial storage or operator program. And so the, the background here is that our public network uh, was bootstrapped from a lot of individual providers. And there's 22,000, uh, over 23,000 nodes now uh, in 107 different countries, providing a lot of, uh, provided by a lot of individual operators with a smaller number of nodes typically and a relatively small amount of capacity. And when data center operators uh, participate in the public network, um, there are a number of undesirable outcomes. Um, data center operators are subject to the same restrictions on data distribution as the public network when they participate at that public level. And that means an operator with a petabyte of capacity is gonna fill up at about the same rate as someone sharing a terabyte of capacity. And so they don't earn as much as quickly uh, as it would make sense for someone bringing that scale of, uh, of capacity to the network. Um, but by the same token, those data center operators have faster equipment and tend to have uh, a lot more bandwidth that tends to outcompete the individual operators. And so data center operators and individual operators have different economic drivers, right? Their costs of operation are different. Uh, operators operating on a much larger scale tend to have a much lower cost structure. And also those data center operators tend to have things that enterprise customers find very attractive or even simply demand, right? And that's its storage infrastructure that meets standards like SOC 2, Type 2, or ISO 27001. And so when we launched the storage node operator program, uh, what we did is we created a way for these large scale operators to uh, to participate in the network and to coexist in a healthy way with the individual operators. Um, and it enables us to offer a new category of service. And so there are uh, deals that men, Ben mentioned, for example, the, uh, the, the Conquest deal over one of the largest providers of 
uh, and best recognized brands, and you'll you'll read about this in the press release when it comes out. Uh, in the healthcare space, we were only able to win that because we were able to offer infrastructure uh, in SOC 2 Type 2 certified facilities. And so that was not a deal that we could have won with the public network, but it was also something that we could onboard uh, using the commercial storage owned operator program. Um, now, the commercial operators are able to earn um, a, a larger amount of money based on storing a larger amount of data, uh, but they earn at lower rates, uh, but higher volumes than the public network. And so it creates a nice balance of opening up an opportunity to win deals that we couldn't win and to allow uh, participants uh, that otherwise couldn't successfully be a part of the public network to participate in the storage uh, economy. And so this has been a, uh, a great program for us um, with very uh, um, small uh, fanfare. We launched our, our website and made an announcement to the community. We have tens of petabytes of capacity um, on deck uh, and ready to join the network. And we've already brought on uh, multiple petabytes to service some of these new enterprise customers that require that level of service. Uh, but ultimately, we found that this, this presents a great balance and a way for us to offer a new category of service, potentially offer something at a, at a premium to the market that is differentiated than something other competitors can't offer. Um, and it finds a, a really strikes a great balance within the ecosystem. So that's the, uh, the updates for the community side. Again, it was very exciting to hear from Ben, uh, how the business is growing. It's great to, to have the interactions and the transparency and the relationship that we do have with our community of storage node operators. We try to keep that, that line of communication open and, uh, and communicate with as much transparency as possible. Um, I know that there were a lot of questions in the community. I got to as many as I could uh, between Ben's presentation and mine for the town hall here, but any other questions didn't get answered, I'll make sure that we get a response out uh, in a forum post um, either this week or next. So again, uh, keep the questions coming. Uh, it's great to have that dialogue. If you have more suggestions or feedback as we continue to grow the network, um, please participate. If you're an existing node operator with capacity and data centers, please join the commercial node operator program and spread the word that we have a great, reliable, uh, amazing cloud object storage service uh, at a great price with faster performance and a lower carbon footprint. So thank you again for joining us and we look forward to catching up with you next time.